The tragic building fire that took more than 70 lives in the Johannesburg CBD just a few weeks ago felt like a microcosm of so many issues that are percolating at the same time. So many issues that are going to matter a massive amount to the 2024 election. There were so many messes all intertwined, so much blame shifting, so many politicians pointing fingers elsewhere and kind of betraying their agendas and their strategies for how they're going to get votes in 2024. Let's talk about the Johannesburg CBD, how it's turned out the way it has, all of the decay and neglect and mess and now crime and difficulties around the Johannesburg CBD and all of the narratives and agendas that are being spun around it that are really going to affect the 2024 election. This is the issue with the Joburg CBD. Let's talk about how the Joburg CBD turned into what most people now consider to be a lawless, terrifying, awful place and kind of a place to just avoid at all costs if you can. And it's really quite extraordinary. Remember, Johannesburg is an incredibly young city. Like 140, 150 years ago, it was just a patch of land on a nondescript farm and then gold was discovered and it became one of the centers of the worldwide economy. And so Johannesburg developed rapidly, but it's always fundamentally been a story of immigrants, people from all over what is now South Africa and around the world, trying to make the lives they want for themselves. And Johannesburg, starting in its central business district, flourished so, so fast. Some of the biggest and most powerful, wealthiest companies, banks, newspaper publications, some of the most famous hotels in the world, like the Carlton Hotel, developed rapidly in Johannesburg. And if you go around the CBD today, you can see that history, the buildings, some of them are glorious, beautiful works of art, architectural marvels. Johannesburg CBD was truly the place where the money resides. What a money reside, what a money reside. So apartheid government comes to power in the late 1940s and they immediately designate the Johannesburg CBD as a whites only area, a white people only area under the Group Areas Act, which means that black South Africans are not allowed to go there to live barely even allowed to go there to shop or just to hang out. Most of the time, they're only allowed there if they have a permit that gave them permission to go in there and work and then leave. This is the context where these incredible buildings were built and these companies were made. But from about the 1970s, something interesting started happening, right? Because the CBD of any place in the whole world is the place where people go to try and make money, to seek their fortunes. That's true of every city, town, country in the whole world. And so South Africans of color were still trying to spend time in and live near, particularly live near the CBD because travel costs are brutally expensive. A fundamental part of apartheid was spatial apartheid, forcing black people to live far from places where they could work and make money and spend a lot of their money on transport costs. But poor South Africans of color wanted to be in and around the CBD so that they could make their money. And the apartheid government became less and less good at maintaining strict laws of the Group Areas Act. So these what became known as gray areas started to crop up like Hillbrow most famously, Yeovil, Bramfontein, in and around the Joburg CBD, where people of color started figuring out ways to live, often in secret and illegally, but they started to get away with it. And so this really interesting and now famously cosmopolitan community of people started to and then set in and developed. Then into the late 80s and the early 90s, it's like the apartheid government stopped providing security, providing policing or anything in the Johannesburg CBD. It really felt like they tapped out of being a government. And so poorer people moved to the Johannesburg CBD even before 1994 and tried to find places to live there. But because of spatial apartheid, there weren't many or any places to live. And so very reasonably, township style shacks started to crop up around the city of Johannesburg. This rapidly unnerved a lot of, let's be honest, racist, white South Africans, wealthy ones, business people in the old Joburg CBD. And this had a lot to do with the big apartheid project of Swat Ghaffar. The propaganda that the apartheid government spun that the Swat Ghaffar, the black danger, black South Africans were primitive and savage and evil and barbaric. And they, if they weren't stopped, would rise up and destroy the country. And this is what the apartheid government peddled for like nearly half a century. And they used it as a strategy to stay in power because they would say, vote for us because we are the ones who are holding back the Swat Ghaffar. We're keeping you safe. Horribly racist, super disgusting, super effective because they created a paranoia and a fear amongst white South Africans that kept them voting for them. Remember what I'm saying now because it's going to crop up again later on this exact episode where we talk about the xenophobia happening around the Johannesburg CBD issue today. So 1994, 
ANC comes to power, they have a lot to do. The city of Johannesburg is already going through some tumultuous times because there are more poorer people moving into Johannesburg. They're trying to overcome spatial apartheid, but there's nowhere for them to live. There's no decent services to help them. And there's no local policing, courtesy of the apartheid government hangover, no local policing that is effectively trying to deal with crime. Because of course, when there are poor and vulnerable people and there is a lack of law and order from the government, criminal organizations move in extremely fast. So petty crime starts to rise in the city of Johannesburg, in the CBD in particular, in combination with poorer people looking for work and trying to live in the area and setting up shacks, the SWAT Khafar hangover sets in. And as the crime rises and the law enforcement fails to deal with it, there's a panic-stricken moment. White flight starts to happen. Businesses start closing up shop and decide to move out of the Johannesburg CBD. A lot of them move to Santon, this new absurd ivory tower that is perfect and rainbows in a fantasy land and looks like a set of a, of a sci-fi movie. That makes the situation way worse because there aren't big businesses trying to push governments to provide law enforcement in that area. It makes it way worse because buildings start getting abandoned by businesses and then criminal organizations, hijack is the current term, took them over because they knew that they could capture these buildings, which no law enforcement was coming to kick them out of, and they could fill them with shack towns, villages within the building. So if you walk into a hijack building in Joe Big CBD right now, you will find like corridors and alleyways inside floors where dozens and dozens of rooms made out of corrugated iron or worse are built and then it's rented out to desperate people who are there seeking work, seeking money and seeking a new life for themselves. Successive national and local governments do nothing to stop this or try to effectively push back the tide and things have got worse and worse and worse over time. And worse than just neglect, there is plenty of evidence now that awful government-linked tender corruption has been happening in and around the Joburg CBD, which has caused critical basic services to not be provided and for things to fall into disrepair. And so what's happened in Johannesburg CBD is just an extreme example of what's happening all across South Africa, where basic services and things, public amenities from law enforcement to potholes have not been maintained by the government. And very, very often the government has acted in corrupt ways to exploit opportunities where they are pretending to help but actually just enriching themselves and we've all noticed by now but south africa is hurtful so much conversation online is who are these people voting for the anc why are they doing so why are they doing this to us and of course the anc gets the vast majority of the vote it's got over half the vote in every single election and of course there are many millions of people who will probably vote for the anc again in 2024 but for the rest of us sick of it. And this is where all the spin comes in. The different agendas, the different narratives and lines that politicians are trying to build to help themselves and their parties in 2024. And so many of the bad ones came out to play in full force after the Johannesburg fire. The first one and biggest one is immigrants, foreigners living in South Africa, being weaponized by so many powerful politicians and it's dangerous it's really scary just two days ago on monday the bbc released a documentary on operation dodula this vigilante group that completely law unto itself irrespective of government authority or intervention is going around intimidating harassing abusing and in many cases it seems inciting lynchings and killings of foreign immigrants whether they're illegal or not no passports already checked visas aren't recognized they're trying to terrorize and scare away foreigners on this idea of the foreigners have stolen our jobs and they're stealing our women and all of the criminal syndicates, all of them are Nigerians or they are at very least African immigrants from somewhere else. Even though the vast majority of gangs in South Africa are run by South Africans, but this narrative is being built. And here's how it happened with the city of Johannesburg. So the 31st of August, 2023, I was on air and we watched it explode in front of us online, specifically on Twitter, as journalists and emergency services were arriving at the scene and we were starting to hear about this terrible fire and maybe some people were dead and people were being evacuated and we didn't know the shape or the form of it. But already on Twitter, we saw thousands of tweets from accounts with little South African flags and hashtag Patriot or hashtag put South Africa first or whatever saying, it's the illegal immigrants. It's the evil illegal immigrants. Everyone in that building, including the criminal overlords who hijacked the building around it, are evil, bad, illegal immigrant foreigners. And they were claiming this 
before there was any way to know that that was the truth. There weren't even journalists, many journalists on the scene yet. We didn't even know who had died or how many or who was in the building or if they were immigrants or not. But the vitriol, the xenophobia spread like wildfire. So all of these accounts, and some of them are huge accounts like Lorato Pele, because you can make a fortune off of building huge bot accounts and then just selling your viral Twitter account that you built off of fake news and lies and bigotry. You can sell your allegiances to people who will give you money to tweet, tweet certain things, push certain narratives and make certain hashtags rise. So these Twitter accounts were tweeting and they were tweeting and they were getting huge numbers. And you know when you go on Twitter and you see a tweet with 10,000 likes, 10,000 retweets. In instinctively you think, oh, this must be credible, or at least this is a representation of thousands of people who have validated this as something they stand by, agree with, have checked and know. And so subconsciously, that's the story that is coming out even before the journalists and actual news organizations and the mayor and essential services have arrived to find out what the truth is. And if you go and follow all of these accounts, some of them are even very open about it. They do something called follow trains. Now, this is a strategy that is used all around the world. A follow train is this. You and a group of other people agree that you will retweet, like, support, reply, tweet, whatever to their stuff, no matter what they do, unthinkingly, automatically, and they will do the same for you. And if you build a network big enough that everybody does this, then you can elevate whatever tweet that gets put out because you game the algorithm. The algorithm suddenly sees, say, three, 4,000 accounts immediately pushing a new tweet and it validates the tweet and pushes it higher and higher because it's doing well. Then you add on the fact that there are enormous networks of bots. These are Twitter accounts that are empty. They're not run by sincere or genuine or real persons. If you go on their feeds, it's just retweeting the same people and doing nothing else, no likes, no nothing. They're not active things. They're programmed and automated to push certain accounts. And so what we saw in the morning of the Jobbik CBD fire before any good facts could come out about the actual situation was the xenophobic narrative of it's the evil foreigner from outside attacking us, taking our stuff and overrunning our cities. Now that's a very specific agenda that's been developed and grown slowly for a while. All of these bot accounts were very supportive of Herman Mashaba a couple of years ago. So Herman Mashaba now and again would have some very ugly quotes about us versus them and this versus that. And he would just say them in these kinds of accounts go, Herman is going to sort it out. And it gets messed up with the safety and security narrative because Herman Mashaba got very big because he was the one who was going to clean out, clean out. You hear clean out doesn't sound like a human when you're cleaning out the inner city and the CBD of Johannesburg, he became mayor, then he left the DA, and Action SA's early success was because of this reputation of the law and order guy. He was kind of, you know, saying the right catchphrases, but now all of these bot Twitter accounts have abandoned him and they're pushing South Africa first, or Operation Tudula, or whatever, because they say that mashaba has gone light. He's like not being xenophobic enough for them. They say he sold out by having tea with John Stenhazen. And now it's being aided and abetted by more and more politicians who are willing to stray there or go full on. Gates and McKenzie for the Patriotic Alliance have been touring the country, just saying they will raid and they will kick foreigners out and they'll put them out on the street. But if you really think about it, they're speaking about human beings and they're being really awful. And they were kind of performing that narrative after the fire too. So why are so many politicians starting to do this? Well, unfortunately, terribly, it's because it works. As we saw with the apartheid government, the politician creates the idea that the enemy is invading and we are the only ones keeping you safe and protecting you and pushing them back. It works for the ANC government to peddle this kind of crap because they get to say, it's not our fault that everything's fallen apart. It's not our fault in the city of Johannesburg, CB, for example, that law enforcement disappeared and everything became dilapidated and we didn't defend our buildings and therefore the crime lords could take over and do what they want with those places. They don't have to say that. They say the illegal immigrants have invaded. It's beyond our control and now we will fight them back. They get to scapegoat somebody else and shift the blame from themselves. By the way, that building that was hijacked and then burned and it was the tragedy of more than 70 people dying was a government and is a government owned building. Ironically and awfully, it was used to provide shelter to women and children who were the uh, victims of being out on the street or homeless or suffering abuse, domestic abuse, sexual abuse and the rest. And the government underfunded it, didn't care about it, let it get to lab And then one day it was in such disrepair, crime lords walked in and told the employees to get out. And when the employees said, no, we won't, they said, well, then we'll deal with you. And the employees went to the government and said, help us. And they didn't. No law enforcement came to fix that situation. So this is very useful for the government. It's very useful for 
opposition parties because they get to say the government is failing to protect you but we will protect you we are the ones who can fight back the invaders and it's very evil and xenophobic because what they're not speaking in facts and they're not speaking in evidence and they're not speaking fairly about the true situation where overwhelmingly immigrants illegal or not are vulnerable in pursuit of a better life probably escaping a tragic scenario and trying to turn things around and there is an orchestrated campaign definitely financed an agenda as most obviously seen on twitter with what i just described to you to push this narrative and make it a thing that can be talked about in 2024. It's this horrible tired shtick preying on the base insecurities, fears and paranoias of people, same way the apartheid government did with the Swat Khafar, being played again. And it's sickening and sad. But it's not the only thing that is at play here. So here's the NGO fight. So a lot of people are now without evidence saying the NGOs are at fault for the illegal immigrants being there because they're pointing to the fact that often the city of Johannesburg, local governments across the country are prevented from doing raids and kicking people out onto the streets from these hijacked buildings by NGOs taking them to court to stop raids, to stop evictions. But the key thing is the NGOs keep winning in court because they're on the right side of the law and the law agrees with them that the government is being unlawful and illegal and infringing on people's human rights because all humans, irrespective of where they are born, are afforded and recognized with fundamental human rights in South Africa. So you can't take away somebody's shelter without providing a solution. And so if the government is gonna do stuff like this, they have to create alternative means of accommodation. And Ndiwe Zulu is saying, oh, but they can't because of apartheid government, special apartheid. And I vaguely get that, but at the same time, two things. One, it's been nearly 30 years. It's been nearly 30 years. I'm sorry, it doesn't take 30 years to build alternative housing or try to take on a serious crisis of accommodation solutions in the city of Johannesburg. But secondly, Lindiwe Zulu, it's been nearly all your mayors. It's been nearly all the ANC in the history of Johannesburg. Obviously, there have been coalitions recently, but in the city of Johannesburg's history, it is the ANC who has neglected all of this into disrepair, allowed crime lords to rise, allowed hijacking of buildings, allowed exploitation of poor people in these areas by criminal gangs, whether they are South African poor people or foreign poor people. This is exactly 30 years of your government's making, this exact fire crisis and this wider Joburg CBD disaster. But again, outsourcing of blame. There are now these vicious, unfounded conspiracy theories appearing all over the internet, and often from these big accounts saying the NGOs are at fault. Some are even saying with no evidence, none, no evidence at all, that the NGOs are in cahoots with the crime lords, that the NGOs are stopping the government from getting in there because the crime lords are giving them a cut of all the rents that they're extracting and the NGOs are making money and the NGOs run the country. And again, no evidence that NGOs are doing anything evil at all. In fact, the only evil from an authority that we've discovered in the last three weeks is a, an elected Johannesburg city councillor being arrested because they helped a criminal organization to hijack a government building in 2019. They did the bureaucratic corruption nonsense to make a building vulnerable. And they have been working with that criminal organization to keep it hijacked and pocketing plenty of the money. But all of this is percolating and it's all being strengthened by fake news and bots on the internet and it's already becoming a hardcore headline issue for the 2024 elections. And here's the last issue that the city of Joburg fire really showed up in a really devastating way. It's coalitions. Coalitions are South Africa's political future. Political parties have to learn to work together. They've been an absolute horror show at trying to, to do this in the last few years, and particularly in the city of Johannesburg. Now, the city of Johannesburg only had three mayors between about 2000 and about 2017, 2018. They've had eight mayors in the last four years. How does this heighten the crisis? Well, a lot of the work of maintaining a city center and stopping hijackings is local government work. But if you are a local government official who's been assigned to law and order in the city of Johannesburg, saving buildings, maintaining government properties, keeping the streets safe, and you get to work and you're six months in on a big project, and then suddenly there's a coalition change and your government, your ruling power brokered structure is out of power, then someone else comes in and they can choose whether or not to pick up the project that you started. Maybe they won't. Maybe they have no interest. Maybe they don't have the team or the vision assigned. And then six months later, they might be out because there's a new coalition because the political parties aren't mature and stable enough to hold a power broker deal together. 
And then a different person comes in and a different and a different and a different and nothing gets done. And that is exactly how coalition instability screws up cities. So that's the issue with the Johannesburg CBD. All of these issues, these stories that have culminated in this extreme example of the messes and dysfunction and the political strategies, all of these strands came together in this terrible, naughty mess around this tragic fire in the Johannesburg CBD. And we'll see. But I'm pretty damn sure that all of these are going to be very, very influential to the 2024 election next year. Thank you so much for watching. That's the issue with Dan Corder for this week. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Also, you can stream us for the longer conversations. Find us on all the social media. And remember, South Africa is a movie. Come watch it with us. We'll be back next week with the next episode.